Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Barnabas Church. I am the Reverend Chris Vaughn. I am a transitional deacon filling in for Father Justin while he is away on vacation for these last few days of August. Um, it's amazing to see you all here and to welcome especially our friends here and online who have come to hear a word from the preacher, Susan Jackson, this morning. So we look forward to that. In the meantime, we will begin our worship with hymn 525. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us confess our sins against God and neighbor.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. For the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice.
wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. <coughs> my salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth in me. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of the Lord. Standing as you are able, let us say together Canticle 16, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Standing as you are able, let us sing together hymn 427.
A reading from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, son of Judah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Is this thing working, David? A little more. A little more? Okay. If you can't hear me, uh, wave your arms. Mm -hmm. So, um, before you, I start, you may have noticed some new faces amongst us today. Indeed, the person who just read the story. Uh, Lynn Jordahl Martin, who just read Paul's discourse on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is my co-mentor in a class sponsored by the Episcopal Seminary in Suwannee, Tennessee. This course is called EFM, which is short for Education for Ministry. Lynn, and Chris, and I all became friends long ago at a training session for EFM, long before Chris and I became classmates at Yale Divinity School. And the other new faces in the audience are all participants in our group or recent graduates. Would you call yourself recent? Not your um, if you have any questions or want to learn more about what we do, please feel free to ask any one of us at coffee hour. It's a four-year long class, um, but you don't have to sign up for all four years. We meet once a week and work our way through the Old Testament, the New Testament, church history, which I'm sorry to tell you a drag, and <laughs> theology. And along the way, we share our spiritual biographies, we eat together, and share an occasional glass of wine. And we become, in the very best way possible, our own small church. And I have some ringers here, but I also have some people in the church who participated. Sue Ann participated, and John Nelson, who's hiding in the back, also participated in EFM. And they would be good people to talk to if you have any interest whatsoever. As you all have no doubt noticed, Justin likes to start his sermons with a story, usually about himself, making fun of himself, but, and never making fun of Jewel, but it usually includes Jewel. And sometimes we have the dog in charge front and center. Something personal. So I'm gonna follow his lead today. I want to start by reading the same gospel passage that Chris just read from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And I wanna read a different version. It was written by a Presbyterian minister named Eugene Peterson who thought the world needed a version of the Bible that common people, you and me, could, was, that was easy to understand and in plain English, straight and to the point. Although I can hear most of my professors at Yale Divinity School shudder as I say it, I think for today's lesson, he's done a great translation, and here it is. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who are people, I'm sorry, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, some people think he is John the Baptizer, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the other great prophets. Jesus pressed them, and how about you? Who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus shot back, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of a book or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. And this is the rock on which I will build my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. He's to open door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. And then he swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise they would tell no one he was the Messiah. So, once upon a time, there was a girl who grew up in Oklahoma. And I have visitors in the back from Texas, so I have to go easy on the Oklahoma theme. <laughs> now, Oklahoma can be an interesting place, but frankly, not all that interesting to an ambitious young girl. As soon as possible, and in this case, that means the so-called age of reason, 18 years old, and we can talk about that later, <laughs> she made plans to escape cow and oil country and move someplace else. And the heroine of this story, though certainly not sophisticated, had heard of Harvard and Yale. She had almost perfect SATs and was valedictorian of her very large and impressive high school class. You can scratch the part about impressive. So she decided to apply to both. Imagine her surprise to learn that neither one of them was open to her. At that time, Yale allowed only men to apply, and Harvard shunted her off to a place called Radford, which to her knowledge was a character in a Jane Austen novel, and she wasn't going there. <laughs> so fast forward, our heroine did very well academically. Please don't feel sorry for her, even without attending Harvard or Yale. She married someone she still loves very deeply, had two beautiful children, and two beautiful granddaughters, who most of you have met skipping up and down the aisle. But way in the far back of her psyche, there was something missing. So 50, count them, 50 years after the idea entered her head that she might go to Yale, she applied to Yale Divinity School, was accepted, and finally began her studies in New Haven in 2018. But our heroine has always liked to be prepared so before she started, she decided she would go to summer school at the Divinity School. What a great way to be, you know, put on the uniform and head on up to New Haven. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, her first teacher was Professor John Collins, which just happens to be her sainted husband's name. <laughs> she saw that as a sign. At her very first class, he taught her something very important, which I would love for you to learn today. What he said to her is, the Bible is wide open to interpretation, and the best interpreter of the Bible for you is you. The learned and wise Professor Collins said to me, directly to me, I don't know what comment I precipitated this, but he said, who better to interpret the Bible than you? You get to decide what to I am so grateful for a church and a learning of an institution of higher learning that gave me that freedom. Think about that. You get to decide what to believe about the most revered book in the world. And furthermore, you're the person who can best adapt it to who you are and what you need. Let's see how we can together interpret the wonderful story that Chris and I just read from Matthew. And that story is open to interpretation by each and every one of us, each in our own way. As usual, Jesus is wandering around with his friends, the disciples. Bear in mind that these disciples were humble people, 
They did not go to Harvard or Yale. They were not rabbis. They were not wealthy. They were fishermen and farmers. Most definitely, they were not theologians. When Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? They went backwards into Jewish history and named some noble Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Jeremiah. And oddly enough, someone who had just been murdered by the Roman authorities, Jesus the Baptist. John the Baptist. But then Peter, that very same Peter who denied he was a Jesus follower three times after Jesus was seized by the Romans, that very same Peter blurted out the truth. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Christ, which is the very first time in the book of Matthew that Jesus was recognized as the Son of God, and Peter did. So what are we to make of Peter's declaration today? Much ink has been spilled so that theologians can answer Jesus' question. But I think all those theologians may have missed the point that Professor Collins sent me to ask myself, and that I now ask you, who is Jesus? You. you probably believe Jesus is the Son of God, otherwise I don't think he would be here today. But what else is Jesus to you? Your Savior? Your confessor? Your companion? Your key to eternal life? Your Redeemer? Worthy of praise, as we just heard in the last hymn? Jesus is certainly not the scorekeeper, Santa Claus. We've learned that much from Justin's sermons this summer. Each of us, as thoughtful Christians, needs to answer that question for ourselves. And I don't think reciting the creeds we say on Sunday quite answers Jesus' question. I pray and have prayed for many years that St. Barnabas is the place we discover what Jesus means to us, each and every one of us. At the end of the story, Jesus sternly orders his friends, his disciples, not to tell anyone what they had just discovered, what Peter had articulated. Again, many biblical scholars have discussed why that might be. Perhaps, he didn't want his true identity revealed to the Jewish authorities or the Roman military. Maybe he wasn't ready to declare his public ministry, and he didn't trust his disciples not to spread the word about who he truly was. Perhaps. But I like to think that Jesus wanted his disciples to do what I'm asking you all to do today. I think Jesus wanted them to ponder, think, and wrestle with the question, who do you say that I am? And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Holding our questions in our hearts, let us borrow from the faith of the saints and confess our knowledge of the Holy Trinity in the words of the Apostles' Creed, standing together to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. We give thanks for the news this morning that presiding Bishop Michael Curry has been discharged from the hospital following a successful surgery. We pray for all who have died that they have a place in your eternal kingdom. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you are gracious, the lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please raise your voices in singing hymn 522.
be seated for a few announcements. David. Standing together, we'll close our service of morning prayer this morning with hymn 304. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit.